in the house. We see our guest speakers. Thank you so much, Dr. Chini, the Milk Booster. And thank you, Dr. Rena, the Noisy Niger Pediatrician. I'm a fan of both pages on Instagram, on LinkedIn, doing an amazing job. And we're set to have an amazing time listening to them talk to us and address us um, young career moms, you know, trying to juggle this career thing and nursing mother thing. So thank you so much. Um, we'll just give a couple of minutes for other people to join in and then we take it up from there. Whilst we're waiting, we have a beautiful video we want to show you. So please sit back, relax, turn on your suit belt. You're in for an amazing ride this afternoon. So in a few minutes, in a few seconds now, the video will come up and then we get on the ride. Thank you once again for joining. Um, whilst we wait for more people to join. Thank you so, so much. Okay, we'll get the video now. My experience as a mother breastfeeding my first son, most in particular, um, I had to do um, exclusive for him the first six months after reading through the importance of exclusive breastfeeding for him. When I got pregnant, of course, it's a natal training. You know, they would teach you how to breastfeed, how to position your baby well, and all of that. But when you give birth, it's a different ball game. Really, as mothers, when we breastfeed our baby, it gives us this kind of bond with them, you know. It helps the mother to come back to shape, you know, on time. I'm talking about um, the fact that while breastfeeding, uh, your body produces um, oxytocin, which is good for the uterus to come back to its, um, you know, the original size before you go pregnant. Breastfeeding is a perfect food that we as mothers can actually give to our babies. It helps in their growth. And in their development. I'm happy that I, you know, I did exclusive breastfeed and I also breastfed even afterwards. So I look back and I see a healthy baby and I'm thankful that I got the support and then I'm thankful that I took the pain to breastfeed my daughter. I know that as working class mothers, it's always difficult for us to do this exclusive breastfeeding for our babies. So that is why we at Wimmer Bank, we have a courage where we can come with our babies so we could um, come around to breastfeed them as often as possible to ensure that they, um, they have the six months exclusive breastfeeding. There's a, there's a room that is very comfortable and convenient for us to sit and breastfeed our babies. Breastfeeding is not a death sentence. Um, breastfeeding is what you give, is the best gift you can give to your child to yourself and to the world at large. Amazing, um, amazing. I hope that we enjoyed that video. I hope that we took one or two um, from yes. it. I mean, so those are some of our mothers, um, also employees of Wemma Bank PLC talking about what the experience is. I mean, today is all about us. I believe that we're going to have more and more women. I mean, especially career women, nursing mothers, you're a businesswoman, all across this event is open to everyone, whether you're an employee of Wemmer Bank, whether you're a customer of Wemmer Bank, the general public. So what I'd like us to do, please, if you're on this call, please share the link to your friends and colleagues, to your sister, share the link to a mother. Today is all about us. We're celebrating us mothers who are nursing mothers, career moms, business women. We're celebrating us because it's all about us today. And we're talking about the subject of breastfeeding. And like I said earlier, we have experts in the house who will be speaking to us, sharing their thoughts, sharing learnings. These are thought leaders in the industry. Um, they're both medical doctors, pediatricians, so everything around how to take care of our children, how to cope with breastfeeding, it can be a, uh, it can be a one hell of an experience and it differs from woman to woman. But again, that's why we have put up this uh, event together 
to address some of the issues we're going through. So please share this link with another woman who can benefit from this and let's enjoy the session together. Um, once again, this is Sarah, this is Wema Bank. I would have our a head of our Sarah uh, Gender Banking speak to us shortly. Who will be talking to us about why this program was put together, who it is put together for, and all the things that we stand to gain. Once again, we welcome you to the, today's session, and we look forward to the amazing things you'll benefit from it. Like I said, if you've not shared this link with somebody, please share so they can join in and they can get the best of it. Okay, right about now, I'll hand over to our head of uh, gender banking, Sarah Community, Abiola Oluwashio. Abiola, over to you. Thank you. You're muted. Abiola, you're muted if you're speaking. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so um, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you to our doctors, um, Dr. Chini, and of course the noisy pediatrician. We, yeah, you, you two are, are quite a delight on our social media platform, and we learn a lot from that. So basically, um, my name is Abiola. As I was introduced, um, I work with the Sarah proposition of the bank, and basically, this is our approach to banking women uh, as, as a bank, irrespective of your socioeconomic status, there's always something that Sarah brings to the table for you. Um, I'm going to just take about two minutes to engage us about what Sarah is. Like I mentioned, is our proposition to women and we have a lot of offerings and goodies for women and not just only women, also the kids are also invited to, to Sarah. So basically we offer access to finance as a business owned, um, as a female entrepreneur, a woman entrepreneur, you have access to loans that can cater to your working capital to meet your immediate needs. If you like to buy assets, if you like to buy a vehicle, we also have loans for green finance, etc., that are available for you as a woman. And all of these are at discounted rates. So instead of the normal, the usual interest rates that you typically get, we have discounted these rates for you as a woman, as a businesswoman. In addition to that, we also offer free health plan because we are mindful of the fact that health is wealth. And of course, whether you're a businesswoman, whether you're a professional, health is something that is paramount to everybody. So in addition to you taking our loans, right, it also comes, which is discounted, by the way, it also comes bundled with free health plan. I think that is something very amazing. We also have the Sarah Premier Accelerator Program. And basically we offer various skills and trainings, development programs, et cetera, for women. So this is not even just limited to you as an individual. If you're a business, if you're looking to start a business, if you have an existing business and you want to expand, the Sarah Premier Accelerator Program is something that you actually need to watch out for. Even this month, we are going to be, we have a learning series in partnership with Enterprise Development Center, EDC. So please ensure that you follow our social media and do register and prepare to attend. It's going to be a physical program. In addition to that, you know, by just being, we have partnership that gives you access to various health plans. By just dialing the code on your phone as a customer, star 945 star 75 as you have access to a bouquet of health plans that are available. And guess what? You don't even have to be a customer. Just dial that code, we'll prompt you. And if you don't have an, a, a relationship with us in the bank, please, a lot is waiting for you. And lastly, for the children, like I mentioned, Sarah is about the woman. And one of the things that we know that is very dear to us is our children. We also have the Royal Kiddies account that offers high interest yielding accounts for children. So basically, if your child is between day one to 12, the Royal Kid is is account is available for them. They can op you can open this account for your ones, for your children for, with as low as 500 Naira, and you get extra start extra 1% um, interest rate, you know, above the standard interest rate. And your child has access to various goodies. So we have the Weber Educational Award, we have scholarship opportunities, we have financial literacy programs and cash rewards available for the children. And of course, during this webinar, we'll be rewarding five mothers who have opened Royal Kiddies account today. So please stay tuned and um, enjoy the program. Tayo, back to you, please.
Thank you so much, Olu Abiola Oluwa Sheon. So you've heard it from her. A lot of goodies await us today. You just might win amazing prizes. So please stay tuned to the end of the program, especially if you've opened the Royal Kiddies account. Please ensure to open. Um, like Abiola has said, there are a lot of amazing opportunities and potentials that await you if you join the Sarah community, if you open the Royal Kiddies account. Uh, this is brought to you live by Sarah. Wema Bank, and thank you so much again for joining the session. Yes, like I mentioned, we have two amazing guest speakers in the house today. Like Abiola said, they're a delight on our space. Every time I open my Instagram, I'm looking forward to seeing Dr. Rena's videos or and Dr. Chini's videos because, I mean, as a mother of three children myself, amazing um, stories that are being told, amazing things to learn. Every time I'm forwarding the video to my husband, there's just one thing to learn and one thing to practice. And it's amazing that we've had, we brought them into the house today to speak to the larger community. So if you're not yet following Dr. Cheney and the Noisy Niger Pediatrician, if you're not yet following the Milk Busters or the Noisy Niger Pediatrician, search for those handles on Instagram and follow immediately. Also, if you're not following Sarah on Instagram, if you're not following Wema Bank, please ensure to do that. All those handles, you need to be following them. So we're getting into the business of the day shortly. I'm just going to read the profile of our guest speakers and we take it from there. Okay, in a few minutes, we'll be hearing from um, Dr. Cheney, the Milk Boosters. I would just like to read her profile. Um, just before then. Dr. Chinenye Obiwane is a WK, popularly known as Dr. Chini, is a medical doctor, a consultant pediatrician. She's an international board certified lactation consultant practicing in the UK. She's the founder of the Milk Booster and the Breastfeeding Doc, a member of the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine and Lactation Consultant of Great Britain. She's a graduate of the Medical University of Silesia, Poland. She practiced as, sorry, excuse me. She practiced as a medical doctor in Ireland before relocating to the UK to continue her medical practice. Her journey towards becoming an international board certified lactation consultant, BCLC, and providing professional lactation services started when she had her first child and struggled with producing enough breast milk to satisfy her newborn baby. Dr. Cheney felt helpless and imagined she had failed as a mother. With her medical knowledge and personal experience, she began to research and came up with a solution to increase her breast milk supply, which immediately resolved her breastfeeding issues. She later found out that a lot of mothers go through low breast milk supply, and then she began to share the same solutions that increased her breast milk supply and started educating mothers to up-to-date breastfeeding practices, which are found in her book, Breastfeeding with Ease. Dr. Cheney has now helped over 50,000 mothers achieve their breastfeeding goals. As a thought leader in the field, Dr. Cheney was contacted several times about the need to donate breast milk for premature multiple births. With increasing demand for donor breast milk and a community of mothers with surplus breast milk, Dr. Cheney launched the first human milk bank in Nigeria. Let's give a round of applause for this. This is an amazing feat. Well done, Dr. Cheney, for all that you do. Dr. Cheney currently serves as the CEO of the Milk Booster Breastfeeding Company, the Breastfeeding Doc, and the Milk Bank NG. These are three organizations and three pages you should be following as a mother. She has made it her mission to provide healthy breast milk, which is the perfect nutrition for sick preterm babies. Excuse me. Sick term babies and healthy term babies, and that no mother will feel like a failure on her first motherly duty, as Dr. Chini did it with her first daughter. So that's that um, for Dr. Chini. Thank you so much, and um, we appreciate you being on this call with us, Dr. Chini. I'll just quickly read the profile for Dr. Rena, and then we take it from there. Just a moment. 
Dr. Ayodele Rana is a consultant pediatrician, digital health communication expert, health blogger, as well as a woman and child health influencer. He has seven years of experience in caring for children in both preventive and therapeutic settings. He infuses a healthy dose of comic relief, wit, and charm in presenting free, free public health education and instruction in global practices and child care by making learning for parents fun and exciting. With his online blog on Instagram, The Noisy Niger Pediatrician, he volunteers for non governmental organizations like Ask the Pediatricians and Luvia Health to promote health and wellness to undeserved communities in Nigeria. He has won several awards for his volunteer work and was a nominee for the Force of Wellness at the Trends Up Awards 2023. His great passion and career focus is working towards ensuring that no Nigerian child dies from preventable causes. He hopes to achieve this through his medical practice as well as public enlightenment via his various social media and offline platforms. Let's give a round of applause for our two amazing guest speakers once again. We say thank you so much and we appreciate you being here. Um, breastfeeding, World Breastfeeding Day is one day in the year where we, we celebrate mothers, we appreciate mothers for the amazing work that, that they do. Like we read in Dr. Cheney's um, profile, and I'm sure she will speak to us about it. It was a struggle taking care of her first child, breastfeeding her first child. And I know that a couple of us on this call have had that experience at some point in time. You have um, um, painful breastfeeding, nipples are cracking, the baby is crying and refusing to latch on. You're unable to latch on, your lactation is um, little in quantity and a lot of other, so many issues. So I know that we have questions already that we've prepared for our um, panelists and speakers. I will, in the course of their presentation, we'll be asking them the questions. So once again, this session is put together to celebrate you so that we can learn, ask questions, and you know, celebrate the gifts of motherhood and breastfeeding all together. Right about now, if we're ready, if Dr. Chini is ready for us, we'll just take Dr. Chini's um, quick session, and then we'll uh, go ahead with questions after. Thank you so much, Dr. Chini. If you're ready, we're also ready for you. Over to you, ma'am. We see your screen, Dr. Chini. Yes, we see your screen. Thank um, you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, just want to just run straight with this since you've done the introduction so that we we just start. so today i'm just covering like more of the benefit of breastfeeding and the challenge with the team and like you mentioned i did have like a lot of struggle with my first baby and these benefits were what kept me going because i really wanted my baby to enjoy these benefits to breastfeeding and, and as well i I wanted myself to enjoy the benefits from breastfeeding this, but there's just so much that I could share. So what was the benefit um, to breastfeeding to the baby? But before I even jump into this, I wanted to highlight that when it comes to breastfeeding, the benefit is not just only to your baby. The benefit is not just only to you. It's also a beneficial um, act that follows your child for the long run. So even whenever you're breastfeeding your newborn, think about it that what that milk you're giving your child is going to follow your child to their, they become a toddler, follow them all the way to teenage age, when they become young adults, and even as an adult and an elderly person. So this benefit follows through. It doesn't just stop at one phase. So benefits to baby we have here like um, fewer childhood infection. So whenever you're breastfeeding your baby, you're giving your baby all those milk that has antibodies, antiviral, antibacterials in them. So they protect, they line the wall of your baby's gut, preventing your baby from having any issues that comes to like the common infections. So, and we know that every year we do lose like 
a lot of babies, over 100,000 babies in Nigeria as a result of this suboptimal breastfeeding. And it's because of that, those babies they are not enjoying, that they've not been allowed to enjoy these benefits that we're seeing. So one of the other benefits is like we know diabetes, different cancers, childhood obesity is reduced when you're breastfeeding your baby. One common one that people always protect about is like when you breastfeed your baby, your baby has an increased IQ. And studies have shown that time and time again that when compared to when a baby does not get breast milk, when they get breast milk, they, there is an impact on their IQ. As five-year-olds, studies are done over five-year-olds, it's been done as teenagers, and that impact has been shown. When you give your baby breast milk, you're protecting their cardiovascular, you're protecting, like you're literally saturating that baby with milk that goes across their body. So you find a study that showed like teenagers, and they, they did a study on teenagers and they found that those of them that have got breast milk, there was a reduced chance of high blood pressure in them because of they got breast milk as a baby, not as a teenager. So also one of the common things is sudden infant death when a healthy baby just dies, we find that with breastfeeding, this is reduced significantly compared to when the baby is not exclusively breastfed. The same thing with allergies. We have babies that have allergies, even those that have um, family history of allergies. Breastfeeding them reduces the risk of having those allergies, having asthma, having um, atopic derm dermatitis, all those skin and you know health issues that come as a result of you know um, allergy. I'm just going to run through this because of time. So when it comes to the mom, there is a risk of, um, it reduces your risk of developing osteoporosis, it reduces your risk of breast and ovarian cancer, reduces your risk of cardiometabolic disease. So when we're pregnant, there are changes that happens to every pregnant woman. Whether you want to breastfeed or not, your body is going to make that decision for you. So one of the things is that your body is going to start storing more fat cells during pregnancy and the aim of this extra this extra fat cells is to support your body during milk production postpartum so whether you like it or not there will be more adipose tissue stored in your body and another thing is when it comes to insulin resistance so we notice all these changes blood pressure so all these are like metabolic changes that happen during pregnancy and when a mom breastfeeds then she is able to get her body back to the base the basic the basal and uh, metabolic state that she was before pregnancy compared to when a mom decides not to breastfeed so you can see that when a mom decides not to breastfeed she stays on that high um metabolic changes that happen during pregnancy, she stays on it for a longer period of time. And studies have shown that, you know, being on that level for a longer period of time will increase your chance, your, your risk of getting like, you know, cardiovascular issues. So you do, you want that kind of support from breastfeeding your child. You know, it helps with weight loss. I've told moms, breastfeeding needs calories. It consumes much more, a higher percent of calories than your brain does. So all those calories are something that, your body is being taken out of your body. The only time, the only thing that would show whether you lose weight or not is what goes into your mouth. And that's why like, you know, with the milk booster, it's just products that would not make you overindulge. It's not, pro it's just products that will help you to now get your body to even produce more milk because the more you produce, the more calories you burn and the higher chances you will notice yourself coming back to your pre-pregnancy weight. It helps with postpartum bleeding. So you see that um, when women um, have, have, their, have their newborn, if they are breastfeeding, it will reduce the duration of that bleeding. But if they are not breastfeeding, that bleeding can go for a prolonged period of time. It helps maternal bonding. And like I mentioned, it will reverse the pregnancy changes. So another thing I was... Um, I'm going to highlight is the importance of workplace. Sorry, before I jump onto that, I wanted to mention that all of these benefits I listed, you know, they follow your child the same way they follow you. So they keep up with your child as your child is growing. And even like all these um, behavioral issues that we see in kids nowadays, autism, ADHD, breastfeeding has shown studies that they are reduced when a mom breastfeeds. So coming to our theme for the year, which is, you know, breastfeeding, how to make 
breastfeeding and work, work. So we have um, here importance of workplace support for breastfeeding mothers. And I wanted to highlight the, the importance to the mom, to the organization and to the government. So I've always said that if organization really understood how beneficial it is for them when a mom is supported to breastfeed, they will all do it. But I guess like the general um, knowledge is that um, you know, is 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 affecting them negatively. So many feel like because the fact because they have a mindset is affecting them negatively, they do not support it. So for a mom, when a mom is being supported to breastfeed, because imagine you're at home and now you have to go to work. So you're already feeding your baby a specific number of times, you're providing milk a specific number of times. When you're supported at work, like we watched in video, you have like a crash at your workplace, or you have like a lactation room and break times to be able to pump, you will be present at work and being it will reduce absenteeism. And why is that important? Because your child will keep getting that breast milk. The more your child gets breast milk, the less likely they will have any of those common illnesses that affect children that children that are not getting the product the protective effect of breast milk, the less chances of you having to, you know, have a child being sick and being admitted in the hospital and missing work. So, and then you will spend less on healthcare. So you will not have a, a sick child, neither will you be sick yourself. You will spend less on healthcare. You'll be able to achieve your breastfeeding dream. And when you do this, it's like, you will love that workspace. You will be happy with that, with that company. You recommend it to your friends and you'll be happy that you're able to balance work and life that your baby is not struggling because of you've gone back to work. And then for the organization, I just, like I said, they are not aware of it, but number one, according to like Nigerian Labor Act, you need to support nursing mothers. And what it entails is that when a mom works, you need to give her one hour um, pumping break or nursing break, whichever one that she's using. So if she's able to nurse her baby at your facility, she needs, she's, she's assigned one hour. So to the organization, it's important to be compliant with this law that is already prevalent in the country. And then it gives a positive perception. So when you hear, oh, this company supports breastfeeding mothers, it will encourage more mothers to go and it will encourage more people to come to that company. Like we want to open a bank account now because we know that really they are supporting breastfeeding mothers. It's a cost-effective investment. So that means when a, a an, an employer recruit someone, the cost you will pay in terms of recruitment, in terms of training, you would not waste that money just because of you found out that your employee, the employee you just recently employed is 36 weeks pregnant. So you would not lose that because of you, um, you've already, you've already have all the, you already have all these policies on ground. The same thing with absenteeism, you know, you're not going to have staffs that are absent because of they're able to still provide breast milk. You're going to cause them to be loyal to you. And even for new potential employees, like they will want to come and work for your company because of all of these benefits. To the government, the same thing, like we found that there, there was, um, there was a, a study that showed for every 1,000 Naira um, that, that um, is spent, that they spent and invested into breastfeeding from the Nigerian government, they will, they will save at least 35,000 Naira. So imagine the healthcare costs that the country can save as a whole, as a result of supporting, having policies that support mothers with breastfeeding. Also, like you, you're, you're, you're allowing babies that are being born to enjoy the benefits of breast milk that is long lasting, meaning that 30 years from now, 50 years from now, you have adults that are healthy. You are not going to be suffering with a lot of chronic illnesses because you've, because you've protected them from, from this, um, um, from these illnesses. Then we have your complying with international recommendation and you are going to improve productivity of your female employees. So, just to wrap it up, how to make breastfeeding work, make breastfeeding and work work. So I've outlined the time management, the pumping routine and maintaining milk supply. So one thing I wanted to say is like a plan is what? A schedule is when, and it takes a plan and a schedule to get things done. So first thing is you must manage your time. You must have a schedule. I tell moms that work with me that from the beginning, you already know the work organization you work for. Is it an organization that 
or five months maternity leave, or is it the four months, or, or is it the recently um, six months that you can find in Lagos, um, 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 some Lagos um, federal and government um, companies? So it depends on where you're working at. You need to have that in mind before you plan going back to work. And if you only have three months, it's best that from the time, from two weeks, from the time your milk has established, to start pumping. Why is it like, because, a mom's a mindset is focused on the volume of milk and is and even your your support system their mindset is on the volume of milk so when you leave your baby if there is no milk your support system will complain you you will not be at ease but if for some reason you have a a, a freezer that has a lot of milk and you're at work, no matter what, you have that little bit of peace of mind that no matter what, even if your child is extremely hungry today, there is enough milk in the freezer. So when I tell a mom to start from two weeks, add one extra pump session. If you, if you want to nurse your baby, for most of it, that is fine. But considering that you must go to work, so that baby specifically needs you to start introducing bottle at that early stage. And you can just deal with one bottle feed per day or two bottle feeds per, per day. You just want your child to become accustomed to also getting breast milk via bottle. And when you're doing this, you know, do it the right way that you're pacing the feed, that the child will not become um, so ad attached to the bottle and now refuse to nurse at the breast because you want a child that will be able to do both and do both instantly. So when a mom is doing this one pump session, one extra pump session every day, whatever milk she's getting, she's storing, and then other milk she will pump, she will give to the baby. She will get somebody else to give to the baby. All of this is in preparation for what will happen when she goes back to work. And then be consistent. Don't do it for one week and say, no, I'm tired. I, I, let, me do, let me not do it again. You need to be consistent. You need to be able to manage the time because you only have about three months to make all of this work. And then take ad advantage of technology. Breast pump, breast pump has advanced. We've gone from where we're using the one that looked like a trumpet to to what we have now, wearable breast pump that people put on inside their bra and they go about their business while pumping breast milk. So you take advantage of it because even when you're going to work, you need a routine. So let's imagine now that you are at your three months um, period and you're going back to work the next the next week. You already know how many times your child feeds a day. Does your child feed 10 times? Does the child feed 12 times? You are aware of this thing. So that means that during those working hours that you'll be at work, you need to be able to pump during those times that your baby would have fed if you're home. So why is it important for you? Because with this knowledge, that means you need to be talking to your HR, you need to be talking to your boss about this um, labor act policy that allows you to have one hour that is assigned to either nursing or pumping. You need to inform them ahead of time so that they can they can incorporate it into your working um, hours that out of your total hours, you're going to spend one hour and you break it into, you can have a, a good conversation with them. I will tell moms, instead of using just 30 minutes each, break it into, into 20, 20 minutes, get a double breast pump so that you conserve your time, so that you're managing your time optimally. If you have a double breast pump and you put them together at the same time and you pump for 20 minutes, and you do these three sessions within your eight hour or 10 hour working period, that is good enough to maintain your demand. And then you need to be aware of the milk storage guide guidelines. You need to know that when you pump milk, it can sit on the table for like four hour, three to four hours, three hours in Nigeria. And then when you want to put it in the fridge at the coldest part of your fridge, it should be able to stay there for like three to four days. But when you move it to the freezer, it has the capacity of staying for six months and up to one year if it's a freezer that you don't always go to. And then maintaining the milk supply. So I, like I mentioned, you continue with your total number of demand. You stay consistent with it. Don't skip a session. And if for some reason something happened and you, may, you did skip some session, try to catch up over the weekend. So over the weekend, you can have like a pumping boot camp or you can do a power pumping. Power pumping is when you pump for like, um, you pump now and you wait for 20 minutes, you pump again, wait for 10 minutes, pump again, wait for another 10 minutes and then pump again and then finish. So it's like a one hour block of pumping. And it's something that you can just add to jumpstart your demand again. Use lactation products. Lactation products are made of galactogos, lactogenic ingredients that that um that as have have been seen to 
help support breastfeeding is not going to replace your demand, it's not going to replace you pumping, but it's going to boost whatever volume your body would naturally make. So take advantage of them, use them, incorporate them so that you can get the most volume that you can. And like, as, as usual, get a best breast pump. So like I had a video of a mom that shared with us and she was just working, it's a bank setting and it's like an open, open work area. And she had her wearable breast pump hidden in her bra. She only showed us because she's making a video to send to us, but people around her could not tell that she is sitting on the desk, but a pump is hidden inside her bra. So take advantage of what is available with technology. So now we're moving to challenges faced by working mothers in terms of breastfeeding. And one of them, like at workplace, is discrimination. So when it comes to discrimination, you will find that at workplace because the general um, um, community and people in the in the world don't really understand the benefits of breastfeeding not many people do so except you work for an organization where they are breastfeeding friendly where they make out time to educate their workers um, on breastfeeding and how to support breastfeeding colleagues you would definitely face um, discrimination from colleagues, whether it's colleagues that will feel like you're using their fridge that they used to put their lunch food for storing breast milk and they feel disgusted by it, or whether it's colleagues that feel like they have to leave the room for you so that you can pump and they would have done something else with the, with the room. So you can face discrimination from your HR or from your boss. They can decide to say, okay, that one hour you want to take, you know, we're not going to pay you for it. That is breaking the law. So you have a right to report such scenario. But it, these are things that moms face day to day so that you're aware that you're not the only one that but there are laws that are coming up to help support it if you work for a company that does not have like you know a policy in terms of lactation a policy in terms of maternity leave these are the discrimination that you face in terms as a as a breastfeeding mom and then lack of um, employer liability and no, no job security so that's one of the things that mothers face that when it comes to like um when when they see that this woman is still breastfeeding after she has returned back to work you know people start questioning her her e efficiency they start pointing fingers and before you know she doesn't feel secure anymore in her job she might lose her job or they might advise her to resign so these are things moms are facing these are challenges that real moms are really facing i had a mom send me a message and she said that her working hours does not give room for a break so imagine that and this woman lives abroad so it was very challenging to hear it she works for the health health care department but there is no time for her to take off or pump so inflexible working hours that's another challenges moms face so you find that moms these days there's always a thing that you notice that mothers by the time they have kids either they some of them end up staying at home some go back to work and then they don't continue some work and then they find the, another alternative remote job and then some just decide to start a business or something so and it's because of these challenges that are thrown to them so to be able to have a working environment that will allow you to be maybe off a certain period of time work remotely other times that whole um you know supportive thing that you need in terms of working hours if if you have that then it's great but many people do not have that and you have to speak up and ask for it so some workplaces don't offer the short breaks that i've told you so you have to speak up based on the law that's covering you and then hectic schedules and then like i said like work um work um busy work so let's say you're working in a place and then there's a deadline to meet up you need to meet up with this deadline now 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 and then as a, as a breastfeeding mom you're not you're taking one hour to spend on pumping it will definitely somehow affect but in in the thing is that that moment that you finish pumping and you come and sit down you are very much productive because of you've taking away the stress of in your head about feeding your baby. And then privacy. Many working places are like an open field, both male and female colleagues. There is, in, there is no privacy. There is no lactation room. There is no breastfeeding space. If it's not even a room, there is for lactation. There is lack of amenities. Some places don't even have a refrigerator or a sink that is not in the toilet. Like some places don't have a place for a mom to just um, wash her things or wait to just, she can just keep her things, all of those. And then the fact of male colleagues 
that um, if, it's a, if it's an open space, you're a bit worried about them being around you and you pumping. So these are things that I've seen mothers face as challenges. So either it's from human factor or either it's from the space itself or either it's from the commitment in terms of hours. Moms are facing this. And I believe as a nation and, and as a group of people, we can always do better. Okay, so like I mentioned, for moms, if you're facing any of this, follow the Labor Act, speak up on it early. When you finish speaking on it, ask your HR ahead of time. Do not just wait until you show back to work. Talk to them, have that difficult conversation because we do not want to have it, especially for places you know that they don't offer. But if not, please, when you're looking for a new job, find a place that supports breastfeeding because we need it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Dr. Henry, thank you so much. You were spot on. There was a lot to learn. I'm sure that everyone on this call has speaked a thing or two. Particularly when you were speaking, it was I was just reminiscing. It was bringing back memories for me because for each of my three children, I, I, I breastfed exclusively for six months. And it took me back to the struggles of packing the bottles, packing the breast pump. I'm looking for a place to pump during work hours. I'm looking for where to wash. And I, I can just, in the last things you were saying, I can imagine how tough it is for moms, you know, if they work in places where that facility is not, is, is not readily available, where you can hide in a place and pump. I remember then when uh, the job I was on, when, when, when I had my first child, I would lock myself in the there was a small kitchenette. I'll lock myself. I'll put a shawl. Everybody will be knocking. I'm busy, please, guys. No one can come in. I remember then. Then the, my second child, okay, the same organization where I had my third child. I mean, luckily I had an office. So I'll get up and lock my office. And um, once I'm pumping, everybody will be hearing the sound from outside. So everybody knows once she's pumping, you don't go near the office. Interesting times. I just it just took me back down memory lane. And I'm really grateful for how practical your session was. A lot of mothers can relate. I can relate. Mothers, intending mothers, expectant mothers can also relate. Uh, just like Dr. Chini has said, she's shared a lot of valuable insights on how we can manage this process. It is tough enough to be a woman. Add to being a woman, add being a career woman is already tough enough. Then add to that being a nursing mother, you have to deal with uh, productivity at work. You have to do with taking care of the home front, your baby. Sometimes they're sick, they're not feeding you're not lactating well and all of those issues. And I'm so glad that you were able to, I mean, you were able to do justice to all of those issues that mothers are going through. Um, we have some questions already for you, but we'll take them at the end of Dr. Rena's session so that we can manage our time. Please, if you're on this call and you also have questions, please, in addition to the questions we already have on the um, re re registrations, pardon me, please drop your questions in the chat box. Either you're on Zoom, you're on LinkedIn, you're on YouTube, Put them in the chat and then we'll take your questions after the session. Um, we're trying to run very fast because of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Cheney, for your session. I learned a lot, even though I've been through this process several times. I'm still really grateful for everything that you've shared. Thank you so much. On that note, we'll be moving over to Dr. Rena, the Noisy Niger pediatrician. Um, if Dr. Rena is ready for us, we're ready for you, sir. And we'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. Hi. Hello, Motola. Um, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. We Fantastic. can hear you. All right. Great. So um, let me just thank Dr. Chidi um, for that really um, profound presentation because uh, she has made my work significantly easier. And of course, Chidi is very grounded and um, she is an expert in what she does. And I like to commend her for the work with the Milk Booster because being an entrepreneur and being a mother, is no easy fit. So well done. Thank you, um, Sarah, by Wema Bank for organizing this. I know that um, Wema Bank is very invested in mothers and realizes that mothers are important for society. Let me start off by saying that um, childbirth is not a luxury. Childbirth is a necessity for the society. So on the one hand, while one might feel like, oh, mothers are giving birth because they want to give birth. But the government and society must view childbirth as a necessity because this is the basis upon which the future of the society is built. We're not going to pluck our population from thin air. 
we are getting like, the population that will produce the, the next inventions that will decide our future from these women who every day risk their lives to make sure that these children are here, that these children grow well, that these children become the future that we need them to be, and that we remain the most populous Black nation in the world. But does the government view it that way is the question. Does the government see that childbearing is a necessity and that protecting women and protecting the children that they give birth to are absolute necessities? The answer is that I don't think so. I don't think the government really sees that childbirth is a responsibility for them to protect. And this is why policies and laws are either absent or inconsistently implemented across board, okay? Now, while in Nigeria, what is recommended is 16 weeks of maternity leave for mothers, most organizations, especially in the private sector, will probably give only 12 weeks. So by three months, the mother is already preparing to actually go back to work. And if we say exclusively breastfeed for three months, so for six months rather, and then by three months, we are trying to make the mother come back to work. What kind of a, of, of a society are we? Okay. And you ask yourself, I, in my mind, I believe that society still doesn't really know what to do with, uh, you know, mothers, pre like pregnant mothers, lactating mothers. Do we make them work? Do we not make them work? Do we pay them? Which is why you find out that in the United States, actually, there is no federal policy that says that mothers that our maternity leave should be paid. And this is the so-called Western society that we sometimes look up to for certain things. But there's no federal law in the US that says that mothers should be paid. So while in Nigeria, we see that, okay, laws exist, 12 weeks of paid um, maternity, uh, 16 weeks of paid maternity leave, but not all mothers are the same. Some work in civil service, some work in the private sector, some work in the informal sector where they, they don't even have companies that are registered. So how do we protect these mothers? So for the civil service, there are very clearly written laws based on federal or state stipulations. For instance, in Lagos State, maternity leave is actually six months, which is very commendable. And of course, they are paid for the six months, which is very commendable. So one barrier to actually helping mothers to lactate or to breastfeed properly is actually inconsistent laws and inconsistent implementation of these laws. So what can we do? One, I, I read an example of uh, in Bulgaria where um, what they do is that the mothers actually get 13 months of paid leave, maternity leave. And that's probably some of the one of the best in the world. And that pay comes from social security. Okay, meaning that it is the government that actually pays for them to do this. So this means that the government is budgeting and planning for women who will give birth and who will have maternity leaves to get pay for 13 solid months that they will be at home. So in Nigeria, are we planning? Are we budgeting? Do we know the numbers that are giving birth? Are we even budgeting for the people that are around <laughs> and available? Talk less of those <laughs> who are even yet to come. So these are some of the challenges that we have. So from the policy level, these are the barriers that we have. So what can we do? Number one, we, be, we need to begin to advocate. And this is one of the platforms that we can use to do this. So please, anybody here, if you have any relatives, or husbands or relatives that are in government, let them know that Dr. Rena said that women are not doing us a favor by giving birth. Women are doing a duty. They are making sure that the, the, the country goes forward. And so the government needs to plan and to budget so that provisions can be made for women who are going on maternity leave or who cannot be paid by their organizations or whose organizations don't cover, you know, pay and um, leave with pay policies that the government can actually subsidize. So even if the government, even if the um, workplace is given half of the salary, let's the, um, so even if the workplace rather is given half of the salary, let the government pay the other half. And I think that would be very valuable in helping mothers feel like, okay, I'm doing something and I'm being supported in that way. Now, let's talk about um, enforcement of these laws in private sectors. Um, unfortunately, there isn't any regulatory body that can come and say that, okay, we recommend 16 weeks, but you are giving them only eight weeks. Why is that? So 
we need to advocate more and, and, and let the government know that, look, these laws need to be implemented more across board and fines and certain sanctions can actually be given to organizations that actually don't comply with the minimum standard. So there should, there should be a minimum standard and this organization should not go below that. Any organization that actually goes above the minimum standard should actually be rewarded, should actually be commended with some sort of recognition, some sort of reward by the government to say that actually, even if it's tax rebates, to say that you are doing this for these mothers and so we appreciate that you're actually making an, this environment a safe place for mothers and they should, they should be given incentives for that, okay? And we should advocate for that. Now, the unions and um, so, so I, I know that in a lot of private sector, you know, fields, the uh, unions are... Um, not really existent like that, you know. <laughs> but where the government is involved, the unions, I'm not sure that I've really heard any unions really talking about breast milk and breastfeeding. Of course, salaries are important. Salary increments are important. Giving us the money that you owe us for per diem of, uh, of uh, one training that we went for is very important. But who is talking for the pregnant women? Who is talking for the mothers who are lactating and who are actually supposed to be getting time off and as Dr. Chini said and spoke about, you know, things like um, flexible work hours, the one hour break that the mothers are supposed to get, presence of things like a special room for um, expression of breast milk, things like a presence of crash. An organization doesn't have to have all these things, but I think there should be some basic and some minimum, you know, um, level that these organizations should reach below which they should not fall and, and at which point the union should actually say, okay, so what exactly is going on? And these are things that the HR, that's responsible, let me <laughs> let me qualify it properly, that responsible HR should actually take up. So, so I think good HR is all about anticipating what the problems might be. And I do believe that sometimes um, HR, can be a little bit, um, and not deliberately, they, they genuinely can be a little bit blindsided and they might not really realize that these are the problems. And so please feel free as a mother to state what your problems are in clear writing and in clear terms to say that, okay, this is exactly what I need. This is what I'm going through. And this is how I feel that I would be supported. If they now decide not, to you know, provide any of these things that you requested for. Then if you have a union, you can take it up with the union or move higher than the HR because your voice matters. Um, that being said, uh, let's talk about um, support for the mother. We all know that um, support is very important. Uh, somehow, um, and this comes to the society, a lot of mothers have complained to me on my page, and of course I've spoken with you know, a number of mothers that, when it comes to Omugo, the, the, the grandmothers, whether it's your mother or it's your mother-in-law. Sorry, I hope I'm still audible. I, 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 I... Yes, yes, Dr. Reno, yes. we can hear you. Fantastic. When it comes to Omugo, uh, the mothers-in-laws or the mothers actually usually come solely for the baby. So they are only concerned with taking care of the baby, bathing for the baby, rubbing palm oil on the baby, the usual things that you know they normally do at Omugo. But the mother doesn't get any help. And so the mother is still running around. She's still cooking, probably still going to the market, probably still doing the things that the mother should do on top of the whole issue of breastfeeding. And this is a mother that will probably be relatively stressed, especially if the um, social dynamic between herself and her mother-in-law is a little bit um, tense. Also, this is a mother that isn't relaxed. And of course, you know, milk flow is not going to be, you know, as, as good as it should be. So when we say that you are, you, one should come and help a mother, it's not just about bathing the baby. It's about helping the mother with chores. And unfortunately, I think we get it into our minds, you know, as a society doing a mugwa that, you know, she's, the, that whoever is coming is coming for the baby. No, they're coming for both the mother and the baby so that the baby and the mother can breathe, you know, so that they have that opportunity to actually, um, you know, get that, that free time. And that will actually help her to lactate and, and face the duty of um, lactation a bit better. Um, we, I mean, Dr. Shini has spoken very extensively about workplace, um, you know, workplace policies that actually help breastfeeding. So let me just itemize some of them once again. So breaks to breastfeed and express are very important. And of course, she's not going to go and, uh, you know, breastfeed and express inside her car or the toilets. So those are the last places that she wants to go and express. 
I mean, innovative solutions like the um, wearable breast pump are absolutely brilliant, you know, as far as helping the um, process of lactation and expression, you, you know, um, easier. You know, that, that's very key. Um, special rooms, because you don't want to be sharing, again, as you mentioned, that idea of sharing a fridge with where people are putting their regular food and then there's breast milk in there, have a dedicated fridge, okay? For breast milk, that is what one would advocate for organizations to actually put in place. Fresh or daycare within the um, office premises or as close to the office premises within walking distance as possible is also very important and will go a long way in supporting mothers to actually balance work and breastfeeding. Flexibility of work hours is also very important such that if she needs to work from home, let her work from home. If colleagues need to be shifted around, you need to take a shift or another shift or you need something needs to, needs to move, give preference to the lactating or to the breastfeeding mother or to the nursing mom so that she gets the shift that she desires, as opposed to people who aren't necessarily lactating or you know doing those sorts of things. As uh, difficult as myself, because you might some people some people might say, ah, hey, but so I have my own uh, problems to deal with. Well, we understand that, but as much as possible, if within the limits of reason, give preference to the um, breastfeeding mother for shifts and make her work schedule a bit more flexible. So, um, plan, 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 uh, plan before the baby arrives, what it is that you want to do to help yourself to support breastfeeding. So whether you are going to get a freezer that is dedicated to expressing breast milk and that you're expressing your breast milk or pumping at every given opportunity and then storing in the freezer, just make sure that you've made up your mind and that you are making and taking steps to make sure that you actually actualize the dream of exclusively breastfeeding or breastfeeding your um, baby. Let's talk about the fathers. Now, uh, paternity leave, <laughs> rather controversial. Some fathers get two days, some fathers get one week, but the highest I think I've heard about is a week. Well, uh, let's think creatively about this. So, provided, provided that the fathers don't use the paternity leave to go and uh, watch Arsenal and Chelsea, I think rather than give the father maybe 10 days and say, oh, that's all that we're going to give you, why don't you just give the father one day off in a week for three months? One day off in a week, for maybe just give him Friday off in a week so that he can stay at home and then help with the breastfeeding. Does it have to be, okay, we, 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 don't want, we will give you a, what's it called, or, or let him work from, from home, even if you don't want to give him one day off. Let him work from home, from home for one of the, the days of the week so that he can give the mother a foot massage while she's breastfeeding so that he can rub her back while she's breastfeeding. Yeah, you know, that sort of thing, just to make things, um, you know, a bit easier. So let the fathers breathe too. <laughs> give, them, give them a few days off, you know, you know, give them one day off in a week or let them off from home for one day. And of course, everybody's working, you know, the, the sense, there's sense in working remotely. They are not spending money coming into the office and then, you know, they are, um, I, I know that some people are a little bit doubtful about the productivity of people that work from home, but, they can be as productive as you need them to be. It should be about meeting targets. Eh? They'll meet their targets. So just send them and, and allow them to do that. And I think it's going a long way actually in helping. So please allow the fathers to have, um, what's it called, paternity leave as much as possible. So if I go this from the issue of policy, from government, from society, the mothers as well have to plan. Um, Healthcare practitioners, of course, you know, have a role to play in, in continuously. And maybe I should just make a point about um, how our exclusive breastfeeding rates are not as high as they should be because we are adding things like water, you know, because some mothers, some, some um, more traditional beliefs say that we babies that are drinking milk, breast milk also need water. But of course, we know that that is not true because breast milk is like 80, 70 to 80 percent water. Okay, so they don't need any water. So our breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding rates can actually increase. And of course, the benefits have already been expounded by Dr. Chini. And so we, we need to be able to tackle all these barriers and obstacles to breastfeeding by innovative, creative, and sometimes simple solutions that you wouldn't even believe that, how come we didn't think about this? Why didn't we consider this all this while? And it, it isn't a, a matter of um, antagonizing anyone because I think when people hear unions, people always believe that, oh, unions are here to antagonize us, but no, unions are there to make sure that everyone's rights are protected because one day it might be a person A that is pregnant and lactating or pregnant and breastfeeding, and then the next day might be person B. And you know, and person B, whether you know she is for or against the unions, will be protected by favorable laws. 
that are enacted by advocacy and union agitations. And so with these few points of mind, I hope I've been able to convince you and not to confuse you that obstacles against breastfeeding in the workplace and breastfeeding for, for working moms is something that can be achieved with simple and creative solutions. Thank you very much. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Rena. Thank you so much for your session. Very practical. Um, and also building on what Dr. Cheney had shared with us, very practical. I, I, I almost, I giggled at the part where you talked about uh, mothers, mothers-in-law coming for Mugo because every time when I go on your Instagram page, you're either, <laughs> you're sending one straight bullets to mothers or mothers-in-law or grandmas with your white powder and your funny dances and all of that. Interesting to watch. You're such a delight to watch. Thank you for all that you do. Honestly, Dr. Rena, you don't know how much value you've added because um, you've made some of these very big issues, big discussions, you've made them very easy to relate to it just by looking at the dance moves and the white powder on your face and how you're funnily nodding your head to one song. You're passing across a beautiful and valuable message that every single person can relate to. And that's how you know someone who's passionate about what they do. You know, being a male, the, uh, your, your, I mean, as a man, um, your pediatrician. Okay, I'm back. So sorry. I had a technical glitch, but I'm back now. Please confirm you can hear me. Yes, we, we can hear you. Motola. Yes. Okay, yeah, thank you. you so much. So I was saying that, I mean, you are given straight bullets to HRs and we hear you loud and clear. And then the message is well gotten. All of the things that we need to do to ensure that our mothers are comfortable at work. I mean, um, um, a, a de de dedicated room for breastfeeding. And interestingly, at Wemma Bank, we have a lot of these things in place. We have the purple crutch which we showcased at the beginning. We have the purple crutch with a corner for breastfeeding mom. So whether your child is in the crutch or not, you have the corner where you can breastfeed, you can pump your breast milk and you can nurse your baby if you want to. Uh, so that facility is in place, but there, there's also a lot more to do, which we'll be looking at. Um, thank you so much. I From your session, I could gather what you're saying um, emphatically is it takes a village, right, to enable a, a, a woman, a breastfeeding mother to do her duties for her child. The husband needs to be supportive. The mother and mother-in-law needs to be supportive. The bosses at work, hey child, everybody is involved in the conversation. And I'm glad that on this call, the entire public is represented and everybody, you know, is hearing loud and clear how they need to contribute to this magic that is mothers and breastfeeding. Once again, happy world breastfeeding day to every mother on the call. And thank you so much, Dr. Arena. So we have a couple of questions or that have already come in, um, both at the registration point and on this call. Please, to everyone on the call, if you'd like to drop your questions, please use the Q&A button to drop your questions. I will take your questions. Um, there's a Q&A uh, tab, which you can click and drop your question. The first question here says, is there a risk for any child that does not breastfeed? So Dr. Arena, do you want to take that or we'll take Dr. Cheney? Mm, I think Dr. Cheney can go first, actually. <laughs> okay, okay. So let's ask Dr. Cheney, is there a risk for any child that does not breastfeed? And just also another question that is closely related to that, how good are the substitutes to breast milk? Because some women can't pump. So this is a two-way question. Either the child is not latching on or refuses to, to breastfeed, or the woman can't pump. What are the, what are, what are the risks and what are the substitutes if we're going through this? 
So, so I think I will just answer it like differently. So the first thing is that many people um, have a belief that someone is not able to breastfeed. And to be honest, it lies based on their level of knowledge. So there is a reason why there are lack lactation expert, there's a reason why there's a lactation consultant. So this is these are people that have studied and have learned so much in this. Many breastfeeding issues are things that we can overcome, but we need that support system. We need someone that is very learned in that and knows how to navigate it. So many mothers that have have had issues with their first time. They say they, did, they were not able to breastfeed. When I'm meeting them with their second or their third pregnancy, we find that I, I'm able to find the loopholes as to what they did wrongly that made them end up not, not being able to produce sufficient breast milk for their babies then. So having said that, I want to highlight something which I know many of us are not aware of. So earlier this year, British Medical Journal released a report where they did a study on about it was about 10 countries around the world and Nigeria was one of it. So it included that, like the US, the Canada, the UK, um, Australia and so many other countries, but Nigeria was there. It was just 10 countries. And what they did was they, they surveyed all the infant formula brands that are found across these countries. And they looked at the claims those infant formula brands have claimed that their products would do for those babies. And they compared it as against research as against um, uh, um, evidence for, that should be both from the, the companies that produce and from other like, you know, research bodies. And they found that at over 74% of the claims on those infant formula, there was no supporting evidence. So meaning that all those claims were not real. And this backs a study that was done back in Canada in 2002, where they listed 14 risk of formula feeding. So, and these weeks, like what I found with those weeks was that those weeks were kind of like the opposite effect of breastfeeding. So when you say something like a child that is breastfed, you are reducing the mortality rate, like the chances of that child dying. When it comes to a risk of formula feeding, that means you've increased the rate of mortality for that child. So we have like studies that... um that they did and they found that babies that were not breastfeeding were associated with over 14 times increased risk of death because of diarrhea, because of like all these common in things. They found that one, that one was from Brazil. And then when it comes to childhood obesity, it was in Scotland where they gathered like over 39,000 babies. And they found that, you know, the increased rate of those of those of them that end up being overweight was so much and it was related to them getting infant formula compared to those that were exclusively breastfed so the point i just want to highlight is that there is such a huge gap there's, there's, there's such a huge um aspect to looking at this and when it comes to lactation i want to also mention something because lactation is like the mom is producing breast milk so in terms of all this organization not being aware of how it can save them more uh, more money. So you see that infant formula brands keep growing because it's a money-making venture. So lactation biologists are not getting funds to even research more into, into breastfeeding, into how to get mothers to do because of it's not a money-making venture that is seen as per product or something sell and bring back money. So there is such a huge our way to this thing. And what I tell moms is just a huge mis misconception saying that I'm not able to produce breast milk because you can. When mothers that do not carry their own pregnancy are making them produce their own breast milk, when men that don't even have breasts are being able to induce to produce breast milk, talk more of you that carried your baby, talk more of you that went through that process. So what most of these moms are lacking is the expert support that will guide them to achieve it. Thank you. Amazing, very spot on. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Cheney. I love that response, and I'm hoping that the person that asked the question um, also is satisfied um, by the response. Thank you so much. We have a couple of other questions. Please keep your questions coming through the Q&A uh, tab on the call. The next question, I'll take it to Dr. Rena. Um, the person asked, how long should a new mother breastfeed her child for proper brain development and overall well-being? And as a follow-up to that, let me also say, um, ask this question that someone asked. Because as the person said this, I remember your funny videos. Somebody said, they said the best time to win a child 
Be so sorry, what's the best time to win a child? Some people keep saying that more than a year, the child is sucking the mother's blood. So what's the best time to win a child? And how long should you um, breastfeed for proper brain and development and overall well-being? Thank you. Mm, okay. Um, I mean, both very important questions. When it comes to duration of breastfeeding, what is recommended is that um, exclusive breastfeeding should be done for six months. You hear some experts say four months is fine, but why we recommend six months, you know, in, in this part of the world is that um, for avoidance of doubts, just in case really at four months, that child is not really ready to actually transition to semi-solids. Some children are ready to transition to semi-solids by four months, okay? But you are sure that they are ready to transition to semi-solids at six months. So the safest window is still six months. So exclusively breastfeed for six months. Now, the brain of, the, of a baby continues to develop very rapidly in the first two years of life, okay? Which is why they say that continue breastfeeding until two years, but some people also recommend and beyond, okay? So the simple answer is that if you can, breastfeed up until at least two years. So exclusive, breast, exclusive breastfeeding for six months, add complementary feeds, which is the semi-solids at six months, and then continue to breastfeed until baby is at least two years. But if you are a superwoman, you can continue till four, yes, if possible. But, um, so that being said, what was the second aspect of the question? I forgot it. So the person said they said after one year, you are the, the child is sucking the woman's no, blood. Is it true? No, no, that is so not true. That is so untrue. If the child is not sucking anybody's blood, you always dispel in your videos. The, 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 yeah, the child is not sucking anybody's blood. The other thing I heard about is that if you actually breastfeed your child beyond one year, they won't work on time. And I'm like, ah, now wow, you know, how, where do we get these things from? Anyway, but it's not true. It, um, exclusive breastfeeding is not going to delay working. Baby is not sucking your blood. And now, in terms of when to stop breastfeeding, it is really up to you. So while I've given all these recommendations, you know, at the end of the day, you really need to individualize what you want to plan. So for instance, if you are breastfeeding and then you now get pregnant, there's no contraindication and there's nothing wrong with you actually being pregnant and breastfeeding. But I don't expect a woman who is having extreme vomiting in the first trimester, who is vomiting every single thing that she smells, to be breastfeeding anybody. So you need to individualize and then know your body and say that, okay, can I continue to breastfeed despite the fact that I'm pregnant and speak with the physician as well. So circumstances like that might make it difficult for you to actually continue to breastfeed maybe beyond the first year. Some babies actually even stop breastfeeding by themselves. I spoke with the mother today and she said that by five months, baby just took the mouth away from the breast and absolutely just didn't want it anymore. You know, so you make a decision on when you want to decide to actually stop breastfeeding by yourself. But if you can do the absolute minimum of reaching that six months exclusive, anything after that is a jara and extract. It'd be nice for you to do till two years, but based on the circumstances that you are undergoing, you can stop anything after six months. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rena. Um, this question, I'll take it to Dr. Cheney. Please help us with this, ma'am. How true is it that if a mother has reason to be away from her child for a number of days, she's advised to cease breastfeeding her baby because her milk isn't good enough any longer? Is this a myth or a fact? It's a myth. So wow. um, there is nothing that happens with your milk in your breast. The way the body functions is that the, the, the breast milk producing glands are secreting and then there's a reabsorption and it's secreting again. So it's a constant flow of production and taking off and all of that. So it, it, there's, there's nothing that is going to make milk sour in your body. If milk was sour in your body, that means it will form foam now and that we expect your breast to explode with it. That cannot happen. So it, there's, there's no truth that people say it, but there's no truth. As far as it's inside your body, your baby, even though you've left your baby for a very long period of time, if your baby comes to the breast and nurse, what they will get is a healthy made breast milk. Um, I mean, because of raising my children, I mean, there's a lot of things that our mothers, mothers, mothers have told our mothers that have told us. And we just find out, I think the reason why women of those days were saying some things is so that people are not lazy, they just try to keep on doing it. And I think that's why they come up with some of these myths, just to 
is to address some other things, maybe like laziness or tiredness, and just to have something at the back of your mind. Say, ah, if I don't do this, it will go star, it will poison my child, and all of those things. You know, thank you so much. Dr. Rena, it looks like you want to say something. Do you want to add to that question? No, no, no. I mean, I mean, perfectly answered. I mean, breast milk is produced fresh, fresh all the time. Um, just to um, just to add to what Dr. Chini had said about um formula. Um, I mean, I mean, the issue of formula because breast milk is always better than formula in any regard, and of course, we all know this. And um, what has been discovered is that um, you know, the risk of allergies is significantly reduced in children who are exclusively breastfed. They have fewer infections. But yeah. for a mother who, at the end of the day, you know, despite all this advocacy, and they will have that genuine reasons for that, decide that, okay, you know what, I want to give formula. Dr. Chini, Dr. Rena, we understand what you're saying, we love what you're talking about, but you're talking your own, <laughs> because yeah. I'm with my reality, and I absolutely need to give formula. Please, yeah. please, please, and please speak to your healthcare practitioner or your pediatrician about, or your nutritionist about what formula you want to start. Don't just go into the market and say that oh, because this person was using this brand or that person was using that brand and the baby is chubby, then I want to use that brand. That might not be a brand that is necessarily for you because chubbiness mm -hmm. isn't always necessarily healthy. Dr. Chini mentioned the yeah. idea about obesity because there are some formulas that actually have more protein than mm -hmm. is recommended. Now, mm -hmm. the science of formula creation is actually evolving all the time. And there are some formulas that are trying to, but not, you know, I mean, they are trying to make it as close yeah. to breast milk as possible. But of course, we know that it cannot be the same thing. So speak with your um, healthcare practitioner or your pediatrician about what formula can be, um, you, should, you should use so that they can recommend the one that has the right proportion of protein, to actually um, give your baby to prevent obesity, diabetes, because these things can actually cause obesity and diabetes actually in the long run if you're using formulas that are not well constituted or that are not really up to standard as far as how close it is to breast milk. The other thing, yeah. of course, is that um, if you decide that you want to use formula, please, 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 and please pay attention to safety, safety of preparing the formula, who is preparing it, hand washing, sterilization of bottles, sterilization of the instruments, um, making sure that you are constituting it, not over making or, or, or diluting it. Because one of the problem that happened in Africa was that when these companies came and started pushing formula as being better than breast milk, a lot of these parents were going out to go and buy formula that they could not sustain, that they could not afford. And so they were, these babies were finishing one thing of formula in three days. And to try to help this formula to extend a little bit longer, instead of putting 30 meals and one scoop, maybe they will put 60 meals and one scoop so that the child is having more water than milk. So that the milk will, instead of lasting three days, the milk can maybe last them for one week. But these children are coming down with malnutrition and they were having diarrhea and we're wondering why. It was imp improperly constituted formula because they couldn't afford to sustain buying that formula. So if you can, you know, they, we call it AFAS, you know, in the, um, what's it called, in the medical field, it must be adequate, it must be feasible, it must be available, and it must be safe, okay? So you must prepare it in a safe way, it must be available, you should be able to afford it. And so if you must do formula, please make sure that you've met all these criteria and speak to your pediatrician about the formula that you can start. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Rena, before you go, um, before I go back to Dr. Chini, there's a question closely related to what you just said. My baby is losing weight. Is it appropriate to give artificial milk to a month old baby? So I think the concern is this lady is trying to exclusively, exclusively breastfeed, but the baby is losing weight. Why should formula be the solution? Thoughts, sir? Uh -huh. Uh, so, so, so of course, you know, all the, all the top of my head, of course, my first advice would be speak, speak with your healthcare professional, speak with your pediatrician. I commend you for, you know, I mean, noticing that, you know, baby's losing weight. And by losing weight, I certainly hope that you've actually done a weight and baby yeah. was maybe say five kg at not this weight. Looking, right? yes, not, not just looking, right? Not just looking at the baby. Kid. Yes, not just looking, but actually there are objective measures of, okay, I've done the weight at this point in time. I did it two weeks later and baby had actually lost weight. If that is the case, then of course, baby needs to be examined very carefully. If you know you are breastfeeding and you're doing breastfeeding only, breastfeeding only should actually allow the child to gain weight adequately. And one of the reasons why a child might not gain weight adequately, despite the fact that the child is still being breastfed, is the fact that the child is actually not getting enough breast milk. Maybe because the child added as a poor life.
large or there is poor product of estimate of knowing how many wet diapers the baby is having in a day. By one month of age, your baby should be having at least six wet diapers in a day, okay? At least Um, six wet diapers in a day, and by when and it might be that your supply is actually not adequate and you need to see a specialist. Okay, I think Dr. Chini can actually contribute to this as well. Okay, thanks a lot. Before you come in, Dr. Cheney, um, I want to read out a question that is closely related to that one. I mean, Dr. Rena already answered some part of it, but just before you speak to it, let me read out that question. I have a six week old baby which has been exclusively breastfed but is not gaining weight. Her birth weight was 2.6 kg and just 2.695 kg at six weeks. But baby looks healthy, but I'm worried. What can I do? So in six weeks, the baby has only added 0.095 kg. And this mom is worried. What can she do? Okay. So um, definitely the baby is not gaining adequate weight because there's a certain um, number of um, kilos, at least from every month, a child should add one kg. So if you've had like a, a whole six weeks and the child has not gotten up to even one kilo, definitely there is problem with milk transfer. So if you're exclusively breastfeeding, there are things that you have to pay attention. Like Dr. Rena was talking about checking the diaper output. So what goes in must come out. So if if you're feeding your baby and what is coming out is not enough, you're not having at least six wet, six wet diaper, you're not having at least any poo, then that means your baby is not getting enough. If your baby is sucking at the breast, and then you're not seeing active transfer of milk. You're not seeing your baby feeling satiated at the end of the meal. You're not feeling your breast feel emptied at the end of the meal. Those are signs that will show you that your baby is not adequately transferring milk. And these are many factors that people face and they think, okay, I don't have enough milk supply. And it's, when you look at it, it comes down to maybe the baby has a tongue tie. Maybe the baby is not latching adequately. Maybe the baby is just clicking. There are so many factors that is affecting this child from transferring milk now from the mom to the baby. Because when a child is actively putting in that demand at the breast, the milk volume will increase. All the mom can do is to boost it with lactation product. But aside from that, she will see that change in her volume. So this mom, what I see is her baby is not gaining weight and that means the baby is not transferring milk. And what I do, like I wanted to add something in terms of if the mom that was concerned about the one month old. So yes, um, when you see that your baby is completely not gaining weight, you need that baby to try. So what you do, there are different ways to supplement. So according to WHO, when it comes to a mom not Get, giving the baby breast milk directly at the breast. The next best step is to give expressed breast milk. So that means this mom can pump and know the volume she's transferring to the baby. So she can document and say, on this day, my child got 10 bottles of 100 ml of breast milk. If the mom is not now able to give her own bottle of her own breast milk via bottle, there is now the option of, the next option according to WHO is giving milk breast milk still from milk bank. So milk bank being that you're avoiding the informal sharing of milk, you're giving milk that has gone through screening both from the donor and screening from the milk itself, and the milk has been found to be completely clear, that it will be the third option. Then when these three options are not available, that's when the next option comes, which is supplementing with infant formula. And like Dr. Rena said, you need at all of these steps, you need support from your healthcare, healthcare practitioner. You shouldn't be making these decisions alone by yourself. Okay, thank you so much. We still have a lot of questions. We'll um, try to wrap it up. But just before, let's. we want to take a quick um, video break. We'll just um, watch a video and then we'll come back and take a few more questions and then wrap it up. Thank you so much, Dr. Chini and Dr. Rana. Please don't go. Let's just quickly watch this video and we'll come back and continue the questions and round up. Thank you. Media team, over to you.
seasons. I am your sister. I am your friend. I am Sarah. The beginning of better things for you. Sarah by Wema for women who want better. Okay, can we have the video again? From the woman um, who okay, cares to listen to the woman who cares for more. You are a queen. Life is your kingdom. And this is your time to reign. You deserve wings from every dream, a clear path to every destination, an opportunity for every vision and an ally through all seasons. I am your sister. I am your friend. I am Sarah. The beginning of better things for you. Sarah by Wema for women who want better. Okay. Um, From the woman who can. Okay, Abiola, can you confirm if um, the retail team are ready for the quick uh, time on the product? No, we might just have to skip that and then okay, add. Okay. okay, okay, thank you. Are we taking more videos? Okay. Okay. All right, all right. So we'll just take two more questions. Um, there's one question here, and I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Renna, and then the final question will go to Dr. Cheney. The question for Dr. Renna, it says, what is the relationship between postpartum depression and breastfeeding? Does breastfeeding help mothers mentally or not? Uh, it's, it's a very important but tricky question <laughs> because... Um, Postpartum depression um, has um, a lot of precipitants. Um, and one of the precipitants of postpartum depression actually is lactation difficulties, okay? So when a mother experiences difficulties with lactation, you know, they can have a sense of a feeling of worthlessness, that sense and a feeling that they are on, that they are not good mothers that they are not worthy of the of motherhood and, and that can contribute to the feelings that you know bring depression on sometimes you know even the presence of the baby at the at the breast for them is is not a a cheery feeling and, and that can be worse when when lactation becomes difficult or the baby is fussy so lactation can be a contributing factor to precipitation of postpartum depression. However, um, the, the process of lactation for some women, actually, if the precipitant is not the process or the difficulties with breastfeeding, and it is something else, you know, you, you know, just maybe perhaps, you know, they're not getting enough support. Sometimes the process of breastfeeding can actually be an, an, an uplifting experience for some of these mothers, such that um, the, the, the bonding experience between themselves and their infants can actually help them to, um, can, can make them better, feel better, and give them a better mood. But again, these things are very tricky in the sense that, um, if sometimes breastfeeding can start off being a good experience for a mother in the postpartum period and can become a bad experience and can become something that will actually tip them into, you know, that state of depression. So it really is very dynamic and each mother needs to understand and be able to contextualize and express how they are feeling. So postpartum depression should not be taken lightly and of course needs to be discussed with um, a healthcare professional or a very trusted family member such that you are boldly and you are with, without fear of judgment expressing that, look, I really do not want to breastfeed this child because I just don't feel like doing it or I feel like, you know, because I'm not succeeding at breastfeeding, I don't feel like a good mother. Once you have expressed this out, then you can walk and talk through the process 
of why you are feeling this way. And if it comes to become, and if it becomes necessary, even you know, being given medication is another option that can be explored for women who have you know severe um what's it called um postnatal depression. depression in which yeah. Are, Yes, in which is actually even considering harming the baby, which is, you know, a, which is a form, you know, quite a severe form of um, postnatal depression. So breastfeeding can be a factor that can precipitate or worsen um, postnatal depression, and it can also be a factor that can help and, you know, reduce the, um, the degree yeah. of postnatal yeah. depression. So one needs to decide for oneself how one is feeling about it and seek help appropriately. Thank you so much, Dr. Rena. Thank you for that um, amazing response. And I hope the person that asked that question has taken learning from your response. Um, we'll just take our final question to Dr. Cheney. And I'll ask two questions in one that are closely related. This mom wants to know, how can my breast stand again after I breastfeed? And then the second question, which is a final one, um, what is the most healthy way to wean a baby off breastfeeding? And how do you manage an engorged breast after weaning? So those two questions will be the final question to Dr. Trini. So um, the breast goes through a couple of changes from the time a woman gets pregnant. Um, first is the adipose, like the fat starts um, moving away to make more room to the breast milk making glands. So the breast milk making glands are increasing in size and in numbers just in preparation for breastfeeding. And this moves the fat away. So what happens is that that whole change and that whole growth is going to start affecting, it puts a strain on the ligament and all of those things that hold and support the breast. As a woman now moves on to breast, so that's when most changes happen because of that strain during pregnancy. I remember I said, whether you decide you're going to breastfeed or formula feed, these changes must happen, absolutely. And then by the time the woman moves forward to now breastfeed her baby, so her body is just going to follow on, carry on whatever the pregnancy has done, like keep producing milk, you know, as long as she avoids any engorgement, there wouldn't be so much of a strain on the ligament as it was during that whole change of increasing in number of cells. So when this has happened and a woman goes through this process, by the time she ends her breastfeeding journey, the natural thing that will happen is an involution where this breastfeeding making glands begin to eat the, like begin to die, the cells begin to die. So begin, they start reducing back to what it was before pregnancy. And when these cells begin to die like this, it now gives room again for those fat cells to come back. So if you're a mom and you're like at this stage where this pregnancy has, has caused a change in the way your breast look, you just need to be patient to finish up because it takes at least six months to one year after you've completely stopped breastfeeding for those fat cells to begin to come back to fill up. So you really would not know what your breast will look like at the end of that journey until you get there. So, and other things that people can do during this whole process is, especially during pregnancy, wear a supportive bra that keeps your breast like, you know, supported so that the strain on the growing um, glands on the ligament is not severe. Those are the things you can do. Afterwards, when you've eventually weaned and off breastfeeding, you can exercise. So exercises that help build like the chest muscles help as well with breast shape. So the other question that you asked was about um, winning. So how to win um, in the right way is gradually. Any, um, any, any, you know, urgent winning where you just have to just abrupt stop of breastfeeding is not recommended. Reason being that you do not want to have that engorgement. So the aim is to avoid that engorgement that comes with breastfeeding because the only accepted period of time where, when you can have a physiological engorgement is the first days of, of newborn, like after you've had the baby and your milk comes in. Anytime that you feel engorged afterwards, that is like full and that way is pathological, meaning that it can lead you to mastitis, it can lead you to abscess, and you these are the things we don't want when it comes to breastfeeding. So what we want you to do is to do it gradually. Take off one, one, one session, Per, per day, take up one session per week, depending on how your child is reacting. And also know that, you know, winning is a both, is like breastfeeding is a mother and child relationship. So you also have to consider based on your child as well, because some babies, like, you know, they are quick to win. 
why others need like a preparation. So gradual winning is the best. Put distraction and take off one feet session. Put distractions um, during those times so that the child can extend the time that it takes for them to feed again. So that's the best way for a mom to win. And when a mom ends up seeing any engorgement, something like, you know, painkillers and a cold cabbage leaf, applying it on your breast can help relieve with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. My own personal experience with me, um, when it comes like that, I just express. So I noticed when I when I want to wean my child, of course I do gradually, like you mentioned, and then um, I don't feed for a while. It becomes engorged. I express it. I trust it away. The more I express, the the less. I mean, it gets reduced. The, the supply gets reduced, and that has worked for me. Thank you so much. Um, a question just came in on cancer. I just wanted you to quickly touch on that quickly before we wrap up. I would also have um, a quick talk from the retail team on Royal Kiddies and uh, Sarah. Please, what is the best thing to do to also, what is the best thing to do to ensure we are breast cancer free? And does breastfeeding reduce breast cancer? Does it reduce the risk of breast cancer, Dr. Cheney? Yes, breastfeeding reduces the risk of breast cancer, even for a mom that has a history of breast cancer, maybe from the mother or the grandparent, breastfeeding reduces the, the risk. But the key is that the longer you breastfeed. So when we sit down and calculate how much, how long you spend breastfeeding, the long longer the total amount is, the higher the chance of you reducing further. Like, I don't know how, if I'm speaking English correct, but like, if you breastfeed longer, you reduce the risk even further. So try I to am, breastfeed yeah. as much as you can to reduce okay. your risk even further. So that is just what I wanted to say. Sorry, um, just to, to follow up on that question, this thought just popped in. So what then is the fake? So for mothers that... um in their lifetime, you know, never get to maybe have children or breastfeed. Does this mean they're at higher risk of cancer? Yeah, I mean, I'm because just curious. This study, yes, yes, because this study is done in relation to other people, the entire. So you're studying um, women that breastfed for this long period of time compared to those that didn't and those that breastfed less time. So it's, it, the benefit comes with the actual act of breastfeeding. And as long, whether the mom um, did end up breastfeeding, like I mentioned, some women, um, I don't know if it's here, I mentioned it. So some women that are expecting their surrogacy, when they come to me and I put them through the process to produce breast milk, so that woman will still qualify under this rule yeah. of breastfeeding benefits. Okay. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Chini. We deeply appreciate you. Thank you so much, Thank Dr. Brenna. Like we mentioned, please follow the social media pages. The, uh, the Milk Boosters Company, Breastfeeding, uh, the Noisy Niger Pediatrician, follow Sarah, follow Wemma Bank, and follow all the pages. The link to the um, pages will also be in the chat. Uh, we'll just quickly want to take Emmanuel Ogunlolu of the retail team, um, quickly talk to us. Emmanuel, over to you. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Please, can you confirm if I can hear me? Yes, we can see your screen. We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, so I don't know if I'm the only, uh, aside from the book that I've opened already, if I'm the only male here, but even being the male, I've had a lot of um, learnings to take from this um, this event, and it's really a good one that you're actually out to people here. So just like it has been said already, we have a product that would also help speak to our children. That is Real Kiddies account. And with the Real Kiddies account, we understand that it's important for um, parents to have a plan for their children. Like we know it is, it's possible that when you give birth to your child, you would have a plan that you want him to study at a special institution outside Nigeria. It's a good time to start saving for your child early enough now, rather than waiting till that time. So with the reality is that you're not just saving them, you are certain that you would get an interest rate that is beyond the regular or the standard savings rates. So and we also have programs that we organize for children, like our Kid Innovation Challenge, and we also have campaigns that also help parents to keep that saving habit um, so that they can meet their target goal and um, build a brighter future for their children. And of course, with our laptop, you don't need to go to the bank to open this account. On your alert, once you sign up, you can go to my account. You can easily open this account for your child. All you just need to do is take a selfie of the child and, of course, just snap in. That's it. 
bits and speak it, I would need to inform us. hours, you'd have your accounts open. I can easily manage the accounts on the application. So we hope to see everyone of here have an account for your child and let the financial journey of your child begin, as well as you also take into consideration of what we have gathered from this event. So that's all I have from my side. Okay, thank you very much. We have a raffle draw, like I mentioned earlier. Some of our babies are going to be winning, you know, cash prize. If you had followed us, you would have noticed that we actually ran a campaign for this uh, webinar and we encourage our words, our women to open Royal Kiddies account for their kids. So we're going to be giving five women, we're going to be giving their children actually 5,000 Naira cash plan. So um, on the screen here is the raffle draw portal. So we're going to draw the raffle draw and then five people will be selected and they would win the cash prize of 5,000 Naira. So these are actually Royal Kitties accounts, accounts that I had mentioned earlier for children between day one and 12 years old. So Emmanuel, please roll it and let us have our winners for the day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we have five lucky winners, right? And we're going to be engaging these women, of course, the um, parents of, of the child, and then they're going to be credited with the 5,000 Naira each that we are giving to them. So thank you all very much. These are so many benefits that you can actually benefit by opening your a Royal Kiddies account with us at the bank, open for your children, your ward, your dependents, your nieces. So even when you want to, have, even when your child or somebody, your sister or someone that you know has a child, you can actually invest in Royal Kiddies account for that. Give them that form, give them that package so that you, are, you know that you're contributing to the future of the child. So it's not just every time, you know, you buy some toys, make deliberate attempts to secure the financial freedom and future of the child. Thank you very much. And I think on this end, we'll, I would hand over to the moderator. We will just close it. Thank you very much. Prizes from the draw, and thank you for putting this together, um, Sarah community. The link to the pages have been dropped in the chat box. So you can follow uh, Sarah, follow Emma Bank, follow Dr. Rena, doc, follow Dr. Cheney. It's been an amazing time. And we're saying a big thank you to everyone who's been a part of this session, especially those of you that have waited till the end of the session. To all our um, viewers on YouTube, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, and all the social media pages where this event is being streamed live, we say a big thank you for um, joining this session out of your busy sh um, schedule. Thank you so much. We deeply appreciate you. Once again, congratulations to all women and happy World Breastfeeding um, Week to all of us. Let's get off uh, from this session and you know go win in our world, go win in our careers with our babies, with our children, and with our um, um, lives in general. Wishing everybody all the best. Enjoy the rest of your evening and have a beautiful one. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much.